Well, it's really great to spend Valentine's Day morning with you all. You guys are the ones that um, love to grow or want to learn more about growing or get better at what you're growing. You're my kind of people. So I'm so happy to hang out with you guys today. So good morning. It is February 14th, and we are going to be talking about um, soil preparation for our home gardens. So um, today's session is led by me, um, and we're going to be sharing a variety of different topics that will be um, um, you can do. You don't have to do all of them, or you can try all of them, but uh, this is really an introduction to the various ways in which we can begin preparing our soil for home gardens. When I first started, I didn't do any of this. I just cleared an area and put in a transplant. And I think that's kind of where we all start. So this is things I've learned. I've learned from others and I'm still learning because all of these topics are, are all very complex and very deep as we as you go into each one. Today, we're just giving you an overview of all the different items um, and options that you have. So we're talking about preparing soil, but when I say preparing soil, I'm really talking about building soil. So why is building soil so important? Like why do I spend so much time talking about this? Um, and I will bring it up every time we talk about growing plants. So soil is, moth is mother earth's skin. It's her skin that anchors all life on this earth. So everything that is alive, is connected to our mother earth through through soil um, and so we we want to nurture that we want to understand it better and we want to help do what we can to support that um, soil actually creates a balanced ecosystem and it's sometimes hard to know when you have a balanced system because everything's flowing so nice, you don't really think about it. It's when it's unbalanced that we really notice the differences. So we wanna work to create a more balanced system. An unbalanced system might create more, um, more complications, more bugs, you know, it's a kind of an extreme of one or two things. So we want that to be a lot more balanced. Um, building soil nurtures biodiversity. Um, there, the number of organisms that live in a handful of soil outnumber all living people on the earth. So all the souls on this earth is, doesn't even equal what's in, that hand, in my hand of dirt right there. There's just so much, and that's just one little handful. Can you multiply by that by all the soil around the whole world? It's, it's quite amazing. It's beautiful. We don't see any of that. We hardly see any of that because they're so tiny and microscopic. But um, that doesn't mean they're not there. And that's what we need to remember that to pay attention to as we do this work. It's a major natural resource. So it's right there and we can nurture and grow more of it if we know what we're doing. And it's something we can consciously do to help Mother Earth. I love this piece. Um, you know, we, we see so much destruction happening around the world that this is something that we individually can do to help it because sometimes those those issues seem way above and beyond our control, but this is one thing we can do individually to help. And the reason, the main reason why we're all here is for food, but you can't have healthy food without, um, starts with healthy plants, which begins with healthy soil. So every time we talk about gardening, at least with me, we're always gonna talk, about, let's talk about what degrades soil first, because, um, we need to think about what we might be doing and how that works so that we can work better at how to um, nurture it. So soil erosion, that's a, the biggest one, uh, a huge element. And these are only a few, there's probably a lot, lot more, but here at Hopi in the Southwest, we do see a lot of soil erosion. And soil erosion really means when soil containing nutrients, that's usually the top soil, when that's taken away by wind or water. So remember, our, our, so like our skin, Mother Earth's sensitive skin needs protection from wind, from sun, and extreme cold. So large areas that can dry out, so plowing and breaking up large areas can dislodge or break up that top layer, which then gets taken away by the wind if it's exposed. So this picture on the um, your right-hand side of the screen shows... Um, just the other day we were weeding and there's these clumps of grass that 
you know, is a weed in my book, so I'm taking it out. But as we pulled it out, look at all that soil that just grips the roots of all of any and all plants help keep that soil intact. So when I pulled up the clump of grass, a whole clump of dirt came up with it. And so that's really what we're talking about. When we take away the, the covering of Mother Earth, which is any kind of plant, then we, we lose that structure and that connectivity that these roots and plants help us um, to, to help the earth to engage in. So if we remove all the plants and crops and have everything exposed, um, that all those plants give and take nutrients from the soil and all nutrient all nutrients are essential for growth and soil health are lost when we remove all any and all plants. So leaving plants um, intact, if we're not going to be growing that area, is one way to help keep soil healthy. When we, when we also remove any of the plant um, material in the ground, whether it's dead or alive, we lose the potential for organic matter. And organic matter is just anything that's come out of, grown out of the earth, dies and then gets put back in in some form. So our, organic matter is really responsible for giving so many benefits to our topsoil. And that topsoil, if it's, if it's nutrient and alive and, and in its primal state, it will do things like hold water, It'll have good structure, meaning it'll, it won't be too hard or too soft. Um, it holds nutrients that plants need. So that's really what we're working to, to do is um, pay attention to what we're doing. So what else degrades soil? There's a whole bunch of other things that can help um, degrade soil. Depletion of soil through overuse. If we use it over and over and over again without giving anything back, that will, that will lead to um, it can turn a, a soil nutrient depletion and, and, and almost turn it into a desert. Overgrazing, when you continually to cut down, whether an animal does it, whether you do, do it, cut a plant down, the plant doesn't have time to regenerate itself. Remember, its leaves are, its, are like solar panels. They need those leaves and stem need the sun for, to nurture itself. So when we keep cutting, we eventually kill that plant and then which leads to um, a uh, really bare ground. And then when we have things like climate change with increased heat and increased uh, drought, all that will just constantly roll over each other and create a desert. So sometimes when we choose to become a grower or a gardener, when we transition that land to an agricultural state from its natural vegetation, we uh, always don't pay attention to what we're doing. We're maybe just paying attention to the outcome, which is the tomato or the chili or the corn or whatever. So when we transition the ground from a natural vegetation to agricultural state, we always don't pay attention to what's keeping that soil healthy and all that life in it. So when we do things with just one outcome or one reason, um, that can degrade the soil. So when the land is sealed over with concrete or pavement, um, and here we see a little bit with the roads, but mainly in bigger cities, all those microorganisms underneath that ground have no connection to air and they suffocate and that depletes that vitality. And plus when it rains, all that rainwater, instead of going into the ground, it gets moved, it, it shifts and moves somewhere else. And uh, there's a great article or story in Los, about Los Angeles, how um, there's, they get so much rain, and I mean, enough rain actually in Los Angeles to help with the um, water shortages they have in the Southern Arizona area. But because it's all concrete, that water just runs and goes off into the ocean and they don't benefit from it. So those are just some things to think about. Monoculture production, that just means growing one thing um, uh, requires a, lot, a large amount of fertilizers and pesticides. So if we're just gonna grow one thing, over a large landscape, this is really about industrial ag. Um, you know, we so much help is needed to just produce the outcome of that one plant. And so, as home gardeners, we're we're also we don't really do monoculture anyway, but we're looking at diversity of plants because any diversity in anything just helps um, the vitality and fertility of it. So, what is our role as growers? Our role, it takes, have, did you even know this is crazy? It takes 2,000 years 
for nature to produce four inches of fertile soil. I think that's about four inches. Four inches of fertile soil, 2000 years. And that fertile soil we talked about holds water, nutrients and helps plants grow. We're losing uh, nutrient rich fertile soil at an amazing rate nowadays because of a lot of things. So our role as growers would be to look at how we can not only grow food, but do it in a, in a good way that supports soil health. So there's a whole um, industry called regenerative agriculture. And it really is a way to grow that looks at conserving resources that you don't need and doing it in a way that supports um, life. It also looks at rehabilitating maybe plants or animals or water or soil as they're growing food and farming. So um, it's, it's really a different way to look at growing food. And this is a larger kind of ag approach. It can include topsoil, like we're gonna work on building topsoil, increasing biodiversity, improving our water cycle, like capturing and moving it around, um, and even resilience to climate change. Like we, we should be thinking about these things as we're growing food. So as our organic growers, that's kind of what, what we are learning today is we have our part too in the process of growing food. So we're gonna, all these uh, methods we're gonna talk about today will we'll really introduce you to all the different ways we can begin to do that. So there's a picture of my worms from the worm bin. Um, we went to check on them about a week ago and they're healthy and strong. And they're just hanging out underneath the, all the straw mulch, eating food, all our food waste. And they turn that food waste into compost. It takes about a year, but I don't have, I don't, I'm not that rushed. And they just do it their own price. And I don't have to bother them much, but feed them. So this is just one way in which we continue to recycle things that we have and then build um, compost, which will be added. And we'll talk about that later. So where do we begin? How do we begin building soil? The first thing we always talk about is uh, looking at the garden bed, the place that you're actually going to grow your food. We have something called the double dug lasagna bed. Uh, this is not a requirement, but it will really change the way your, your soil uh, increases its fertility and vitality. So the double dug lasagna bed, you all get a handout on that. Um, includes digging your garden bed, wherever you're gonna grow, wherever your growing space is, you dig down three, uh, one foot, what is it, four feet? One foot, sorry, I haven't, I haven't made one in a while. <laughs> you dig down one foot and take that dirt out of the area you're gonna plant. And then you layer these items at the bottom of that bed and then cover the bed back up with, with the dirt that you pulled out. So you're layering this material like you layer lasagna with noodles and pasta sauce and cheese, and then maybe you add zucchini and then you start the whole process all over again. So you can see on the picture at the very bottom is cardboard or paper. We like cardboard, plain cardboard, no uh, colored uh, glossy cardboard because all cardboard it is as paper. It just breaks down over time. But initially what it'll do is it'll snuff out any weeds that are trying to get through um, if you have any weeds in that area. And then on top of that, we'll put um, a, a carbon, an, a dry material. Here we have straw and leaves. I use, or yeah, straw and leaves. Um, these are probably dried leaves, um, dried anything, your old corn stalks, your own bee plants, your old tomato plants. Anything that was grown out and is dried back up, you can throw that in there. The only thing we don't use are weeds. Um, so if you, if you did a bunch, pulled up a bunch of weeds around, you're, you will burn those. You're not going to um, throw those in your bed. And then we add another layer of, on top of that of manure. Um, and I just add enough manure where I can't see the, the, uh, the stuff underneath. So if it's straw or something, I'll just add enough so I can, I don't really see much of it anymore. So there's no science to it really. I mean, it's not, you know, real methodical. I mean, it is methodical, but it's not exact. If you have enough room, you can do a whole nother layer again, as this picture shows. Um, otherwise, you'll just do one layer and then add the top soil back on top. When you do that, your garden uh, bed, it was level like this. And after you dig down a foot and add material and put 
So the material will bring like you back up to here, then you put the sand back on top. Your garden bed could be way up here. So it's above your original um, elevation. But what happens is as it, as it composts, it lowers and lowers and sinks. And eventually after a year or two, it'll become level again. So those are just things to, um, to remember to know. It's not that big of a deal. I think a lot of us here have bit, built lasagna beds and are big uh, proponents of it. Um, we'll talk about that at the end of the class. Here's another version of the double dug. They have a card, here's the ground underneath. There's cardboard, leaves, compost. They added grass clippings or green matter. So you could put in food waste in here. You could put in, um, you know, yeah, life will still live like stuff that was still living, but you just barely cut. They add leaves. And then here's the soil that they added back on top. So um, this is not required, but it's recommended highly. And let me add this one point down here. It's a no-till method. So once you dig once and make that lasagna bed, you no longer make it again. You no longer need to do anything again to, to add it. You don't have to do this every year or every five years. You, and you don't have to actually dig at all. So um, if you do a few other things, but so it's, it's a lot of work on the front end and then, but you only do it once and you're guaranteed that compostable layer at the bottom of your bed. So it starts to build that soil, it gives nutrients and food to all that life underneath the, the ground. We will talk about these in a little bit and you're getting a handout as well. Um, the, the other things you can do are add soil to the top. So once you add that dirt back onto the top of your lasagna bed, then we're gonna add some soil amendments. This is a picture of a raised bed garden with some soil amendments. Um, it doesn't look natural with some white looking stuff on there. Uh, they all come in different colors and different you know, shades, um, but they're just all coarse ground or finely ground materials that then begin to disintegrate and dissolve. So some of the amendments you can add to your garden would be, um, oh, I put here, you're gonna amend at least twice a year uh, if you can do it or maximum twice a year, but if not, at least once a year. And I would choose when you do it, that way you always know when you're gonna do it because if you don't choose a time, it kind of gets confusing. So, or you forget. So there's two times that I add amendments. I really try to do this every year. It doesn't always happen. Right before I'm gonna um, grow my bed, grow in my bed. So just before springtime, or I'll, I'll add a layer of amendments. And then that amendments will dissolve and go into the ground throughout the rest of that growing year. At the end of the growing year in the fall, right before winter, I'll try and do this again. So that's my ideal plan. It doesn't always happen because I have a lot of beds. So I just did this, me and my husband just did this last week. We knew the snow was coming, so we wanted to get some amendments so that when the snow came, the moisture came, it would take that into the ground. So sometimes you just do it when you do it, when you can do it. So some of the suggestions for amendments are uh, manure. And this is aged manure. I'm sorry, I should put that in there. Old, six weeks or six months old at least. So you can use sheep manure, cow manure, horse manure, chicken manure, or even pig manure. If you have access to any of those, um, what we usually do is we clean out a pen and we pile it and we just leave it there in the fall. We'll do that throughout the year. So whatever we piled in 2020 will then be used for 2021. So we just make a big pile and then we just use that. We don't go to the pen and clean that one out and use it. We, we pile it and have it ready. So you can do that anytime. That's what you should be doing right now is piling manure, getting it ready um, either for this year or even this fall or maybe even next year. You can add compost. Um, we hope to offer a class in the future on making compost. Uh, otherwise you can purchase a bag of compost, depending on how much space you got to cover. And we just layer on, on enough. Uh, it's usually dark in color. So we just layer it on so you can, can't see any of the dirt underneath. So it's, you know, half inch thick. The more you can add, great. But if you have to purchase it, that's a cost. Man-made amendments like soil secrets. You can add things like fish meal, bone meal, something called azermite, which is a bunch of minerals. And there's just so much more. I mean, this is where it gets really complicated. Another area, just do some research, ask what other people use. Um, but 
it's not just about adding amendments. Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that. We'll talk about what amendments you need and why a little bit more. So um, we'll come back to this point. So the other third thing we can do, so we had lasagna bed, adding amendments, and the third biggest thing, always, 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 especially in the Southwest, mulch, 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 mulch. We teach a class on just mulching, so we're only gonna touch on it here. Um, but remember we said Mother Earth has sensitive skin. She needs protection from wind, sun, and cold weather. So this is what mulch actually does. It, it gives you a layer, you're offering a layer of protection to Mother Earth's skin. And we mulch on top of the beds. So the, the amendments are underneath and then we mulch on top. And we always keep those beds mulched if we can. It's kind of hard with all our wind, but we will, and eventually the mulch we use is biodegradable. That's what we want. We want that to break down. So eventually you're gonna always have to mulch um, or keep adding it, but we wanna keep her covered. Remember that. So, um, so what do we mulch with? Here is a picture of um, I'm mulching with straw. Um, we have pine, we can use pine needles. I love pine needles because they don't blow away. They get all tangled and stuck up together. And in our region, that's great. Shredded newspaper, wonderful, but you'd have to put that underneath something because it'll just blow away. Or you could add it and then wet it and it kind of gets matted a little bit. Old corn stalks and bean plants. If you can break those up a little bit, because sometimes they're really thick and long, um, that helps. Dry leaves, uh, me and my mom, Dorothy, are notorious for coming home with big old bags of dry leaves and bags of pine needles from wherever. We're always hauling those kinds of things. We don't have a lot of trees here, so we have to go find it. But there's a lot of people who have a lot of trees who don't like their leaves. So the dried leaves, um, some if they're really dry and loose, they can blow away, so put them underneath like a straw or pine needle mulch. Or you can leave them in bags and let them decompose a bit and then throw them on and they get kind of matted and heavy. So those are just things for us to, to learn. But mulch is huge. There's so many, many benefits we're gonna not get into on this lesson, but we're gonna talk about during our mulching class. Try and mulch if you haven't done it. If you just do this one thing, I promise your garden will be way better. Okay, we also want to fertilize during our growing season. So um, <clears throat> uh, fertilize during our growing season. So that means while our plants are growing, we are going to add fertilizer to, to the ground. So each vegetable can be classified into plant families, right? Uh, I mean, some of you may know this and some of you may not know this, but plants belonging to the same plant family usually have the same nutrient requirements. So learning which plants take more or what, or, or what they take most of, because sometimes they may only need a few kinds of nutrients, that's really part of your job as a gardener and a grower is to help figure that out. And we'll, we'll, have, we'll offer some of this information through some of our future classes, but this is where this is the fun part. You get to go learn about all these plants and um, you know, who they are and who they're related to and that kind of thing. So all plants give and take nutrients from the soil. It's just what they do. I mean, that's just part of growing. Um, some take more and some take more and others give more. So that's when we talk about the nuances of learning about these plant families. So in order to support the soil vitality as we grow nutrients, we, we kind of figure out, okay, who's taking more because I might have to give back what they're taking, help the soil give, you know, give more of those nutrients to the soil, or I can plant another plant that's giving more um, than it's taking either at the same time or later. So those are things we're going to talk about here in a bit too. I always tell everybody, just plant beans anywhere and everywhere you got space. Beans, I swear, they're, the, they're a magic plant. Uh, the more I've learned about them, they're a beautiful plant. They're so cool. But what beans do is they actually take nitrogen that's naturally occurs in the air and through their beautiful ways they take it in and then they transfer that into the soil so they actually give new nitrogen to the soil taking it from the from the, uh, the sky or the air it's just amazing so if you have a, a, any space put a bean plant in green beans these are green beans and purple green beans um, you can grow a, a 
a dry bean, which is like our hatiko, where you have to wait till the whole plant is matured before you pick them, any kind of bean, it doesn't matter. So that's really a, a easy one for you to start with. So when is the best time to fertilize plants? We, plant, we fertilize them when they're young and when they set their flowers. Remember the fruit first comes from a flower that needs to be pollinated and or if a plant is produ producing a continuous amount of fruit. So there's something like um, tomatoes. Tomatoes give you tomatoes all year long. So you're gonna wanna fertilize those more. Chilies, chilies sometimes, oh, will give you plant uh, chilies all year. Once they start giving, they're gonna keep giving until they die. But there's other plants like maybe a root crop that only gives you one plant. So we're not gonna, we may fertilize them um, not as much, but definitely when they're young and, and um, growing out. So if you look down at the list below, this is where it gets a lot more complicated. Some plants need more nitrogen. These are the, these are the three main uh, uh, fertilizers that plants need, but we, we will, as you learn more about that, you're gonna see these three all the time. So for nitrogen, we're gonna add uh, fish emulsion or liquid fish fertilizer. So remember earlier I said adding amendments, some of these could count as amendments too, not just a fertilizer. Um, <clears throat> feather meal or bone meal, I listed that as amendment earlier, but it's also considered a fertilizer. So for plants that need more nitrogen, I'm gonna add a bone meal amendment to that part of the bed or that bed that they grow in. We have to figure out what, what plants those are, right? So, so it's a lot more trickier the more plants you grow. For phosphorus, rock phosphate is just phosphate in rock form and they grind it up. Bone meal again is great for phosphorus. For potassium, azermite. Um, azermite is, comes from the, the old ocean floors and they grab the rock and then they crumble it up and it comes in these little fine powder things and you throw it on your garden bed, but it's rich in potassium. And it has so many other way, way more other nutrients in there too. So this is just an idea of the kinds of fertilizers and the kinds of amendments have different amounts of a lot of our minerals and vitamins. So it's a lot more complicated as we get into it, but um, at least adding compost and manure is, is a good start and then learning what am I growing and what does it need or what is it taking away so I can add more to it. And that's where we all work to become, to know those plants better. Um, you can recycle food waste. Um, this, I just did this the other day. These, these are a whole bucket of eggshells that I've been collecting. Every time we eat eggs, I throw them in this bucket. And um, eggshells are rich in calcium. They have a lot of calcium in the eggshells. So you can feed these back to your chickens and they'll eat the eggshells and they'll gain more calcium, which produces good eggshells for them, for their future eggs. Or I can just add them to my garden bed. So what I do is I take the crushed eggshells and put it in a blender and I run it till it gets very, very fine. And the big bucket, a big bottle jar is just full of fine eggshells. So I blend them up because I turn them into a powder because they're easier to decompose. If you don't crush them up, it just takes a lot longer for them to decompose. But I will add this when my tomato plants are young and especially when they are fruiting. So when I'm, all the tomatoes are ripe, and I keep picking. Maybe once a month, I'll just go out and throw a handful underneath and let it grow, work into the soil. So those are things that we can learn and do. And um, so sometimes you don't always need to buy something. It's just a matter of recycling what you have. So another method. This is where it gets way more complicated and fun at the same time, something called crop rotation. Crop rotation is changing the planting location of vegetables within the garden each season. So remember vegetables are classified into families and plant families or plants belonging to the same plant families have the same nutrient requirements and usually the same pests. So if we keep if we keep growing potatoes and tomatoes, which if you look at the picture here are from the same family, um, we grow them in the same area, the same time every year, we're gonna start to see a real shift in the soil um, vitality. 
tomatoes and potatoes take a lot out of the soil when they grow. Corn does that too. They just, they, they take a lot. So, so if we keep planting them in the same area, we're going to we not do anything else. We're going to deplete that soil and we're going to give pests a good head start because they're saying, oh, she grows potatoes here every year. I'm going to just stay right here if I'm a potato beetle and just keep eating her potatoes. I, we make it really easy for them to, to find our plants when we keep them the same place. So that's another reason. So crop rotation. Um, so we're going to move them next year. If I'm planting my tomatoes over here, um, next year I'm going to move them to a different location. And it could just be a different part of your bed. It's on the opposite side of the bed you have this year. Or it could be a whole nother place, like if your garden is bigger. And then I'm going to put something else there next year and we keep moving those locations around. And if we know enough about plants and what we wanna grow and what we like and know of plant families, then we begin to create a formula that begins helping the soil reproduce its soil vitality by using the plant. Remember I said beans, beans are amazing plant. Um, so I would actually follow beans and peas I would follow a tomato crop with those or a corn crop with beans because they take a lot out. So the next year I wanna add something in. So those are ways we use vegetables and growing to do that. Now this takes a lot more planning and a lot more knowledge, um, but you can see here, somebody did a beautiful drawing and a map of what they're going to grow. So they have root crops in one bed, fruit crops in another bed, leafy crops in another bed, and legumes. So these might not necessarily be in the plant family, but she's divided them up in a different way. So roots are onions, turnips, carrots, garlic, beets, and radishes. She has those. And then next year, that root crop is going to go down to where the fruit crop is. The next year, it's going to get planted over at the leaf bed, where the leaf bed is this year. And so she's going in a clockwise rotation method. And in four years, she'll be back over in the same bed she was at. So they all move. Um, so this is a nice little plan and everybody's got their own versions. But if you want to try something like this and maybe it's even just one bed, like I'm gonna move, let's look at the root bed. Let's say we only have one bed and we have onions. I'm gonna pick something from every one of these squares. We have onions, tomatoes, um, spinach and beans. That's all we're gonna grow in this one bed. So if we had one bed with those four items, instead of moving each bed, we would just move the, the line of plants over one or down one. And where the radishes are, they would go up to where the onions are. Does that make sense? So you can do these in small beds as well as multiple beds. So this is really, really nice. Another uh, method, this is way more involved, but it's very, very cool. I love this idea and I've been wanting to try it every year and I always kind of forget about it because I sometimes the timing is when you, you have to learn about timing with cover cropping. But there's a method called cover cropping. It's also called green manure. So if you hear those, both of those, they mean the same thing. So here is a crop. It's beautiful. Look at there's a beautiful picture of um, plants on top, all the roots, and all the life, which we see in earthworms, at least from our eyes, you can see mulch. Um, all that is working together to create a beautiful um, soil fertility bed there. And let's talk about what a cover crop is. So cover cropping or green manures are plants that you grow to build soil instead of food. So if I go back to this picture, that might be peas. That might be all pea plants, but I'm not growing them to collect the peas. I'm actually growing them to build that soil underneath the plant. So cover cropping usually doesn't require harvesting. You just build, you just grow and you let the plant get to a certain point, depending on what your goal is. Bigger goal is to build soil. So what cover cropping, does, well, it, it will also add organic matter to the soil. Sometimes it releases nitrogen, depending on what the plant you're growing. So it's building and adding nitrogen throughout a whole season. Um, if you cut it before the whatever you're growing sprouts and seeds, 
then you can, then it lays down and falls and then you have a mulch and you leave all that on your garden and acts as a mulch. And then all you leave all the roots in the ground, everything you just leave there and it continues to just biodegrade and creates a beautiful, nice environment for all that life. Um, cover cropping or green manures can improve your soil in one season. So you give up growing something just to build soil. So if you have um, more than one bed, you can just say, okay, I'm not gonna grow in these two beds for this year because they really need help. So I'm just gonna dedicate a cover crop to them and do just that. Or if you have one bed, you can say, okay, I'm just gonna grow in this half because I wanna build my soil in the other half and I'll switch. So those are different ways in which you can think about how to implement that. The other great thing is cover cropping, um, cover crops attract beneficial insects and pollinators because they do, they do seed, they do flower out um, sometimes when you, if you let them, they'll flower and then they, they're just beautiful peas and clover, a lot of legumes from the bean and pea family. They all uh, are used as cover crops, but there's a whole bunch of others, buckwheat, and they just um, produce these beautiful flowers and all that attracts pollinators. So you can do it just to attract pollinators if that's one of your goals too. So this is a picture of a cover crop. Um, you see it's a small raised bed. It's only about six inches off the ground, but um, I don't know exactly what they're all growing there, but it, that's what it would look like. It would just look like a, a beautiful plant. You wouldn't pick from it. it. It would just completely let it just grow until it matures or until some point. Sometimes you don't want them to seed out, so you'll cut them before they seed. Um, sometimes you want them to flower and then cut. Um, sometimes you only want the new growth. So it's, it's of course way more complicated than we're offering here. But it's a great way to, um, to build soil, uh, but it just takes a lot of time. So we did add another article to today's handouts if you want to read more about cover crops, because they'll tell you, it depends on what your goal is and what your time frame is. Sometimes there's warm season cover crops, there's cold season cover crops. So it's, um, it's a really cool idea. But you can see how it begins to build the soil, all that nutrients, the roots, um, just it, it's it's a beautiful way, a, not nature's way. It's really nature's way to build soil. Um, so it takes a long time because nature does take a long time. Cover cropping is and green manuring is a is a very different concept for us. It's like why would you not grow something you're not going to eat? So it, it's it's kind of a shift for um, the the in the concept. So it just depends on what your goal is. Um, and remember, the whole idea for a cover crop is to build soil. So if, you, if that's not really what you want to do, you just want to grow plants and find, try to build soil in other ways, then maybe that's what you do. And I want to add a statement. If you do have a lot of clay um, in your soil and it's just too hard to dig, then I would recommend a raised bed in which you put a lasagna on top. So you would need to build up the sides to hold all that soil in. You want to keep that that clay you the clay is good for nutrients it's just terrible to work with when it's not um uh, when it's all by itself so we add the lasagna on top of the clay then that'll help to break that clay down and those roots on those plants are amazingly strong when you when you grow them and they get um enough sun and nutrients they will dig and go through that clay like it's no problem but they'd have help because they have a lot of critters and moisture so um so if you have clay soil it's great because there's so many nutrients but but you don't want to dig that you'll you'll ruin your back and your tools so we build the lasagna on top instead and then build the sides to have it erased doing we just had snow last night it's really cold today in the next couple of days it'll warm up that's the perfect time to build a lasagna because the ground is wet use that moisture that's been brought to us to um to help you with that bed so um try it do a little bit and see how you like it and if you really like it then you can go ahead and do more the other thing about lasagna is we don't till it once once we do it, right? We it's it's done. We only um, dig once, cover it, and then it's and it's done. So we don't have to go back and till it. Uh, we don't have to go back and do another lasagna. It's just it's just that one time. I do have one bed in my garden that's on a slope, and when it rains, the the bed is down here. And when it rains, all the water runs off, and then it just gets covered with sand because it's it's just in a bad spot so uh, every time I mulch and it the summer rains come it gets covered and so this year um, 
we were working on it just last uh, yesterday or day before and I it was so rock hard on top because the mulch is all covered and it's just nothing but sand and I just haven't gotten to it so I had to actually go in and and break it up the top so I just got a shovel or something called a broad fork you just stick it in and you move the dirt around and you stick your shovel in a little bit more all I'm doing is kind of breaking up that top I'm not tilling it and then once I broke it up I added my amendments then I mulched it again and then we're good to go so underneath it was really nice but on top that first crusty uh, inch was really really hard so sometimes you end up with things like that but all you got to do is just um um, manage it. Keep coming, you guys. We'd love to have you. It's fun hanging out with you. We have a great day.